I worked um, on a project uh, uh, on a well, called uh, 1776 Unites, which Bob Woodson, who's well-known black conservative, but more importantly, somebody whose work has been aimed at lifting up literally hundreds of grassroots level anti-poverty organizations and chiefly black communities over the course of 40 or 50 years. Um, he had a, a project that was meant as a response to the 1619 project. And in the book that came out of it, Red, White, and Black, which features essays from folks like Glenn Lowry and Coleman Hughes and John McWhorter and myself, et cetera, um, there are, there's a lot of history shared about the history of self-sufficient black communities that evolved in the period of time following Reconstruction and, and prior to the end of the Civil Rights Movement. And there were more such communities prior to the advent of the Great Society in particular than there were than there were um, after. And so in Bob Woodson's analysis, and you know he's coming from a decidedly conservative position, but what he says is that the dependency culture that came through the advent of the welfare state disincentivized the formation of self-sufficient black communities uh, and that that is part of what led to the disintegrating of those cultures, that it was more contemporaneous, sure. liberal uh, sort of social engineering. And what's funny about that is that Malcolm X to Dr. Umar Johnson, who's very much a black nationalist and many other people of that ilk, probably a lot of Hotep uh, brothers out there, would sort of sympathize with that. What I would say, because my, my, my point of view on this is overlapping, but a little bit different, is that the cultural struggles of black America have had something to do with the fact that not only are we brought over here through slavery, but at various points, the reset button keeps sort of getting hit uh, on black cultural formation uh, in success and in, and in um, uh, if not failure, some of the obstacles that have been put forward towards us. So with the civil rights movement, the success of the civil rights movement led to the integration of American neighborhoods and institutions, but it also led to something of a mass talent drain from black communities, whereby black people who did well in, in school, who had professional opportunities available to them, left black communities almost en masse, right? to integrate the neighborhoods, to integrate uh, campuses and corporations and institutions, right? But mm -hmm. in so doing, you're taking out a lot of the people who were uh, who had the potential to be pillars of the communities in which, in which they lived. I do think that, and Martin Luther King Jr. criticized it for this very reason, I do think that the welfare uh, state, while the Great Society, I think, was successful in eliminating hunger in America uh, to a great degree, and it was, right? You should never, I, even though I'm conservative leaning on this, I, I try to never talk about the Great Society as if it was just an absolute failure. It actually did a lot of good. But part of what it also did was discourage black family formation by making benefits, incentivizing benefits towards unwed mothers and pulling benefits away from actual two-parent households, right? That was mm -hmm. a thing. That had been a thing for a long time. Dr. King himself criticized that, right? And that has a negative impact on cultural formation. Mass incarceration has a very bad impact on familial and cultural, you know, formation, right? Right. Um, and so, and then there's just the kind of ambivalence, I think, of public education towards black history. Once you get past the basics of slavery and, and um, uh, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, you know? Uh, and so in all of these ways, the project of cultural, cultural formation, self-knowledge, it's complicated for black people in ways that it's not necessarily complicated uh, to, to, to other groups. Um, but I think that a lot of black people are doing their own work in terms of recapturing both African-American history and African history in ways that disseminate it through, through culture, through entertainment, through literature. Um, I think that we need to come to a better place from the CRT discussion uh, to where we can correctly discern the difference between policies and practices which artificially and needlessly inflame racial tensions and racial stereotyping. Also, just having an honest conversation about how we might be able to clarify important and salient facts about American history in ways that don't ignore important parts and pieces uh, of the black story. Why did, Kim, I'm an, I'm an educated guy. Why did I have to get to be like, you know, 25 years old before I knew anything about redlining? Like that's, you know, that, that's ridiculous. But it, you know, that wasn't even something that many people knew about. Sure. You know, 
Um, uh, but so, I, I also don't even know if it's that important to know about. I mean, from my perspective, I, in, in everything that you're describing, I completely understand this destruction of any, you know, any attempt to build a culture or community has been destroyed through a variety of different mechanisms decade after decade after decade for the black community. I completely understand that. But I think my what I go back to is I say that the reason why it was able to be destroyed is because it was flimsy to begin with. It was a flimsy culture to begin with that wasn't rooted in the real culture that was robbed from black people when they were ripped away from Africa, taken here and not given any and, – and basically the culture of the – identity or where they came from was um, erased and and you know just suppressed completely that lack of knowledge I think to me it just roots all the way back to that every single time which is if there was a culture that black people could latch onto and be proud of rather than it constantly being victimization you know well we were slaves and then we were red line you know then there was segregation and then there was redlining and then there was this and that's that's all to, if you root your yeah. culture on that, you're just going to end up with a, a negative culture because it's a negative place to root. So mm. instead, finding a new place to root that tree from, mm. from a place of positivity, from a place a place to be proud of, and that's going to be extremely difficult. Maybe with genetic um, testing, there can be more uh, knowledge. A person can find out exactly what part of Africa they're from and, mm. and have like a culture experience there and – be really proud of their of their culture, their people, their country that they rooted from, would build a positive self identity and a positive community identity that then I think is harder to destroy when it comes from that rooted positivity. It's a lot easier to destroy it when it's flimsy because it isn't rooted in anything real. It's kind of like and, and there was really no choice for Black Americans. The choice was. You know, I mean, what do we do? We have to create, we have to have a culture, we have to create something somehow, some way. But it was so easy to destroy f for that reason. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, how do we solve this is really what we're trying to get to so that black Americans can thrive. And also, um, because you've got this political, we've got a political problem, right, where Democrats want to focus on that victimization constantly. That's mm -hmm. like their whole way of gaining black voters. It's, well, you're a victim. And so because you're a victim, guess what? Other white people are going to save you. I mean, that's like kind yeah. of the message to me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, well first, let me let me just jump in again just on the cultural analysis, because I really do think that all of this context is important. And I absolutely, you know, I absolutely agree with you and think that it is clear that in the social psychology of a people, when you take them away from any sense of where they came from, and the experience of black people in America testifies to this, particularly within and coming out of slavery, your capacity to have uh, a positive quotient of self-esteem, right? Your, your capacity yeah. to think highly of yourself. Well, in the black experience, that was actively ground out of people as much as right. they could possibly do it right and right. so yes that is that is a starting reality that black people in america have had to rebound from and all the way into the all the way into the black power movement of the 1960s i mean you see the fierceness with which black people have sought to do that this is why black power became a term it, it wasn't you know it wasn't about racial supremacy per se. I mean, maybe there are different versions and variants of it, but this idea that I am a man, I am a woman, I am deserving of dignity, there are different ways in which this has expressed itself, but that's why the need for it is there. Having said that, though, I would still push back, uh, I guess, just against the phrase flimsy culture, simply because the, the culture of community formation that did spark up in the midst, again, of severe headwinds, severe obstacles, to create actual successful and flourishing black Americans, uh, black communities, not to mention individual success, that, that is a whole story. There's a whole history there. Again, I'd say consult the work of, of Bob Woodson, John Sibley Butler. Um, but, I mean, the, 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 you're familiar with the bombing of Black Wall Street, right? Right. Uh, black, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Black Wall Street was bombed. <laughs> it wasn't right. that the culture there was flimsy. The culture there was resilient. It was firebombed, you know, but... Black Wall Street was actually rebuilt <laughs> in the aftermath of that. We don't often get that part of the story. So it is a testament to the resiliency of the culture. But, you know, that that culture and these different aspects, because honestly, there are many different streams of black culture, many different streams of the black experience, 
And it's it's very just as is you know that of of white people and other groups in America, but the 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 powerful and productive legacies of positive court cultural formation in Black America, you still want to see them go deeper and spread wider within Black America, right? And so there are different aspects of this. There's there's education. There's the Black family. There's the Black community, um, and all of that. But I I. I see the cultural piece as being important, but I also think that it is related to just the, the the question about material solutions, which has to be broken down in the areas of education, of law enforcement, uh, of the family itself, right? Um, local economies. Uh, and so it, it it's hard to treat it all as just one thing because it's actually a kaleidoscope of interrelated things. But I do think that there are strategies that we can employ to hit each and every one of these items in ways that might amount to a constructive overall program if Democrats and Republicans were willing to see beyond their ideological narratives, just focusing on one side of the coin, to actually just embrace the complexity of the problem and to say, like, actually, there's a reasonable way of thinking about uh, the different aspects of of the challenges that face Black America that could allow us to respond to them coherently if we weren't trying to polarize the issue and exploit Black people for the political gain of one side or the other. Right. Yeah, I I um I definitely think that the the solution is going to be very complicated, and it's and it does take both sides coming together, and I do think both sides are correct. You know, with progressives saying, well, it's 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 the systemic issue and we need more programs. And at the same time, Republicans saying, no, it's a culture issue. I, I agree with both sides. I think that both sides are right to a degree. I Although I lean more on the Republican side, I think that they're a bit more right. And I just still go back to I just don't think you can know. I, I just don't think a person can know where they're going if they don't know where they came from. And I think mm-hmm. that that right there has to be corrected because we could do program after program, we could do all kind. There's there's so many things that could be implemented: community programs to government programs to just ministries going out there and teaching young men. You know, don't mm-hmm. you know you when you get you go out there and get married and and have families and stay with your families, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there could be a whole host of this going on, but I, I still think it's very difficult for for. I think it's difficult for an individual to change. I mean, I look at, for mm. example, abused women, um, and uh, you could get a, an abused woman to finally leave her abuser, and she realizes she's being abused, and she leaves her abuser. And then shortly after, she suddenly finds herself in another abusive relationship, and this is it happens all the time with counselors mm. who deal with people who've been abused. And it's kind of this, like, how in the world does a person find themselves in this situation over and over again? And it's because when you go into that deep root of that person's identity of how they feel about themselves and where they came from, you find that they often grew up in a very similar situation that then just sort of perpetrated and perpetrated. Mm -hmm. And until that cycle is somehow broken is, you know, then each generation suffers the same fate until they can actually break that cycle somehow and not... You know, finally, one of the young women in the family doesn't marry an abusive guy, has an actually great husband, and her kids are raised in this different environment and see something completely different. But even then, the mentality does transfer from generation to generation a little bit because it's taught, right? A person says, oh, I'm a, I don't like men. I'm afraid of men. That gets transferred mm-hmm. down because the young girl that she raises hears that over and over, even if she's had no negative experiences with men. So I think mm-hmm. culture and where we come from imprints on us um, in a way that is very profound. And we see Mm. it on that individual small scale level. And I think we're seeing it on a really large level, not just with black Americans, but with all immigrant communities, because at least like Italian Americans, they eat spaghetti and they say, I'm Italian, (laughs) right? I mean, they've got something to hold on to, even though their family is like, well, who in your family came from Italy? Oh, I don't know. It was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, like my great, great, great grandfather came from Italy, I guess. But I still eat pasta because I'm Italian and I'm proud of that. This is my people and my food. There is something there to latch on to that creates that positivity. I do think that that needs to be corrected in the black community. One of the things I would propose, and it could be just totally far-fetched, but 
w- one of the things I notice is that immigrant black, uh, the African immigrants and the black American community are not intermixing at all, it seems, right? There seems to be like a disconnect between the two groups. African immigrants don't seem to mix with black Americans and vice versa. And I think that almost needs to change. There needs mm. to be an infusion and maybe like an incentive to get the African immigrants in America to embrace, for, or for black Americans to embrace African immigrants and to want to learn about the culture and say, you know, so you came from where I came from, apparently. <laughs> so teach, <laughs> so somehow infusing that culture in so that there is a rooted positivity. I don't know, that might, I mean, I, this might sound completely I get, naive. I get, I, get, or, I, get what, I get what you're saying. And I definitely, look, I, I definitely believe that first of all, I would like to see African African history <laughs> taught yeah. in the schools, as well as a deeper uh, excavation of African American history uh, and its true nuance and complexity. I mean, truth be told, you know, we did this um, uh, red, white, and black uh, book, the 1776 Unites Project. It, they talk about historical episodes that you don't always hear about in terms of the success of black communities. But the 1619 Project actually was an extraordinary triumph of historical storytelling. I mean, there may be some inaccuracies in it. Uh, I think the tension between our project and the 1619 project, which obviously, you know, existed on a level of cultural uh, 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 centrality, you know, that that made it uh, just a, an incredible success in the consciousness. Um, but, you know, they just, Nicole Hannah-Jones overarching uh, narrative of American life and character of, of society being so sort of irredeemably racist that it was hard to be optimistic about the future. I think that pessimism is just something that, you know, at least a person like me felt like, no, there's, there's, there's reason to be optimistic on every level here, right? Let's push mm-hmm. back against that a bit. But the 1619 Project was still a triumph uh, in many respects of historical, uh, passing down historical understanding, right? Uh, these, these things can, can, can flourish. Um, I think that um, one thing I was going to say is that, It's interesting, you know, again, acknowledging as we both do the starting point of divorce from our heritage that is the initial condition of slavery. There is today, I think, increasingly sort of an extension of the griot legacy, uh, you know, in, in, in African culture, whereby you do, I think, have a vanguard of young African Americans. Uh, but you know, this tradition still goes back, uh, a ways, um, Afro-conscious movements that are actively trying to reclaim that history or parts of that history, whereas for the Italian immigrants, the children of the Italian immigrants growing up in this country today, yeah, through something of the melting pot culture of American society, um, you know, historically speaking, which has all sorts of goods and benefits to it, yeah, you know, a lot of these kids of immigrants don't remember their native languages. They're not speaking Italian. They're not speaking Spanish. Right, I mean, some of right. them are. Some of them are. But you see how it begins to dwindle over time. And I think something is lost in that. So in that sense, you know, there's a way in which the trajectory of some black folks is towards deepening that reconnection. Whereas for for other Americans and you know, children of immigrants and you know, white people and so forth. I, I would still maintain that there's a bit of a uh, dissolving of those of those. Well, bonds. of course, but like I don't speak Vietnamese really anymore. Um, you still do. You, know. you still do a good a good accent, though. <laughs> <laughs> I can mimic my mom, but that's funny. But, you it's know, uh, there's people do lose their language, of course. But I still know where yeah. I came from. And it's positive. Sure. Sure. And I think my right. problem, I think what I my problem with CRT, uh, critical mm-hmm. race theory being taught right. in schools is that it's teaching victimization over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Do I think we need to teach the reality of history? Of course, I think we should know the truth about a lot of different things in history. But I think my issue with it is that to 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 have an entire group of people, an ethnic group of people in this country be told that their entire existence is about victimization, about being a victim Mm -hmm. and that everybody else is a perpetrator to their victimhood. I think that's extremely unhealthy for people to be learning that. It, it like where what's your history? What's your root? Like I can at least look back at Vietnam, which was parts of it enslaved by the French, was subjugated by the French for a long time. The Chinese historically 
But I can yeah. look back and still be proud of some of the moments of Vietnamese mm -hmm. history where the sisters, two young sisters, literally women went and fought the Chinese right. and came back warriors to their village. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like things, the food, the culture, there's things there that I can latch onto that are positive and not just, well, we were the subject of a, of a terrible American war uh, mm -hmm. after the French subjugated us, after the Chinese subjugated us, right? Like that, being taught constant negativity yeah. breeds a negative culture that then just can't rise up from that. It's just this constant victimhood. Yeah. CRT, no. I agree with you, should mm -hmm. change where it's, you can teach it, I suppose, we, we definitely need to teach the real, the history, but I think it does need to focus on African history so that the African kid in class, the black kid in class can say, that was my, th that was, those are my people. That was my yeah. culture. That was uh, my yeah, food. I'm, yeah. God, there's so much there. I mean, you know, there is a diaspora culture, let me say, you know, I mean, I remember I was at a philanthropic, um, uh, convening philanthropists from all over the, all over the globe. And uh, there was sort of a diaspora cabal there uh, where you had some African-American brothers and sisters. Uh, you had you know, folks who were from Brazil and in and, and the Caribbean uh, and uh, West Africa. Uh, and, um, <laughs> and at a certain point, they're all taking a picture. And I'm very new to this whole kind of, you know, uh, uh, event. It was my first time at the Global Philanthropy Forum. So I'm just sort of walking by. And then all of a sudden, I hear a brother, you know, reach out to me. He says, hey, you. He's like, you, you, get in the picture. You qualify, you know. And so I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> let me get up in this. And it was a beautiful moment because, you know, there's black people from around the globe in this kind of rarefied space. And there was a cultural connection between us, at least in, in a sense of understanding that if we trace it up the tree, a bit we are all coming from you know from from the same uh starting point and from slavery to colonialism there's overlaps in the historical experiences that descend from that uh, as well as some of the cultural fruits that that descend from that so it's not like it's not like that space of consciousness does not exist but yeah i i i would like to see diaspora consciousness expand yeah while it also while while i would also like to see um undue pessimism towards the american experiment contract now look it's like with everything else you can go too far in one direction or or the other life seeks a balance you know you can be way too pessimistic about america's capacity for social and moral reinvention because america has accomplished this time and time again at the same time you can be unduly naive in terms of the degree to which we have just transcended all of these problems just le leapt over the 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 problematic legacy of of racism by turning a blind eye to the fact that for about 30 percent of black america i mean depending on how you're measuring it but if you look at multi-generational poverty in inner city communities the american story story really runs from slavery to mass incarceration COVID, and george floyd without uh, millions of black americans ever really having a shot at the american dream ever yeah ever 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 because even with the success of the civil rights movement it was success for a portion of black America, that portion of black America, uh, well, for, first of all, very specifically, the intrinsic poverty that existed in most black America was no longer concentrated in the South by the time Jim Crow segregation, by the time Jim Crow policies were repealed, Brown, Brown versus Board of Education, uh, prior to that. Uh, the, the most salient gains of the civil rights movement accrued to black people in the South in a moment of time where black pe most black people were already in the inner cities and other parts of the North and Chicago and, and, and the West and so forth, right? Uh, and so, you know, but you did have gains. You had affirmative action uh, at a moment where it actually was valuable in universities and corporations, giving a leg up to promising black students and professionals who otherwise were dealing with difficult life circumstances. You can chart those gains, but again, Again, actual black communities still suffered in massive concentrations of poverty and also in a moment of time where you needed a degree coming out of the 60s and 70s that's when you have the explosion of the accreditation economy mm -hmm. really you needed a degree to be able to integrate effectively speaking in America's corporations you needed to go through the college and university system you needed that in order to be able to buy into sort of suburban American life and by the way this is you have that you have that 
uh, metaphorical red line of education, which locks a lot of black people in inner city poverty. The reason why redlining is important to be familiar with as a matter of history is because it explains why it is that the home ownership basis of wealth, as obviously you're familiar with, uh, an American life that, you know, obviously largely white people and other folks had access to white people in particular through land grant colleges and you know, uh, things related to the Marshall Plan and so forth. Black people missed the opportunity to buy homes in America while you still could buy a home. Right. Yeah. Because they were racially segregated out of these neighborhoods. And so you don't have that as a basis for wealth in black communities. And if you don't understand redlining, you might not understand why that's the case. You might just think like, oh, maybe black people just prefer to rent forever. You know, right. uh, it's not not exactly the not exactly the case. So, you know, I mean, all of all of this is uh, calls for a complicating of the narrative on all sides. We need more black history. We need more context, but we need less pessimism about America. We need less pessimism about America's um, capacity, I think, to respond to historic injustices. As long as we don't tilt into too much optimism, which, you know, and basically I'm describing the problem between Democrats and, and Republicans right. in certain certain areas right uh let's bring it to the middle a little bit well that um on that note we're going to end this conversation because we're going over time but john this is uh really a, a great conversation to have um and really appreciate your insight on this really enjoyed reading your articles as well where can people find more of your work yeah well uh you can uh, uh f- I encourage folks to join Braver Angels as a member. You'll get a lot of my writings there. Braver Angels is America's largest grassroots organization dedicated to political depolarization, uh, for which I work. But you can also follow me on Twitter, uh, John R. Wood Jr., and uh, check out my stuff at USA Today. Great. Excellent, John. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Love you, Kim. Appreciate it.